Starring Milton Berle. President of the United States, the Honorable Spiro Agnew. Guest of honor, distinguished members at the dais, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, the Friars Club, an organization of good fellows dedicated to philanthropic and charitable causes since its beginning in 1904, gathered together to honor one of its own, Jack Benny. This evening, Jack's name is added to a most select list of illustrious individuals whom the Friars have chosen to honor in the past. Distinguished names like Enrico Caruso, Clark Gable, George M. Cohan, Nat King Cole, Humphrey Bogart, Bing Crosby, and Mayor James J. Walker. So tonight we pay tribute to a man who, in the election of 1968, threw his support to Richard M. Nixon, who promptly threw it right back at him. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Now, it's not that the president didn't welcome Jack's support. It's just that he was apprehensive when he learned that Jack had also thrown his support to Tom Dewey, <laughs> Wendell Wilkie, <laughs> Alf Landon, and William Jennings Bryan. <laughs> Looking around, I see on this dais some of the greatest comedy talents in this country. So I'm not going to compete with them and do jokes about Jack's stinginess or how old he is. I don't know how old Jack is. All I can tell you is that the Treasury Department sent me Jack's income tax return and his social security number was one. <laughs> We're still auditing that return. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we're still auditing all of his returns. <laughs> it's not that there's anything irregular about them. It's just that his classification has the Treasury Department completely stumped. They can't figure out how a man who has been one of the world's top entertainers for 40 years can declare himself a nonprofit religious organization. <laughs> now, I've gone and done what I said I wasn't going to do. I've told jokes about Jack's stinginess and about his age. And I'm going to stop right now. Instead, I'm going to talk about the human side of a great comedian, Bob Hope. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack, but Bob told me he'd never let me beat him at golf if I didn't throw that one in. <laughs> As 
Mr. Vice President, I stand here tonight to say our beloved country faces a great many serious problems. But thanks to men like Jack Benny, we can bear them a little easier. I'm honored to take part in this tribute to Jack Benny. And although I'm not able to stay on for the entire show, since I have no desire to turn this festive evening into a solemn occasion, I'd like to turn the proceedings over to Johnny Carson and let him turn it into a solemn occasion. <laughs> Tonight's, tonight's roast master, Mr. Johnny Carson. Thank you, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Friars' tribute to Mr. Jack Benny. And to you, sir, I thank you very much. You were marvelous. You were actually very, very good. Take those kind it just words. goes to show that the vice president can be funny even when he's not making a political speech. <laughs> and, I think, and I think all of the performers on the dais were very impressed with your comedy delivery, sir. And I respectfully ask that you knock it off. <laughs> I think probably the greatest transformation that your office has, uh, has taken is the fact that you are much closer to the president than former vice presidents have been. Uh, Mr. Nixon, for example, informs you immediately and brings you up to date on the governmental decisions and their policies and their national priorities. I enjoyed especially your comment out in California during the reception for the astronauts when you turned to Governor Reagan and said, they went where? <laughs> The vice president has been a guest on The Tonight Show, and uh, he enjoys a good joke, and he doesn't take them seriously at all. As I was telling the desk sergeant yesterday during my army physical. <laughs> but the vice president has joined us briefly, and we're delighted that he could be with us for even a short time tonight in his tribute to Mr. Jack Benny. You'll have to forgive me when I talk about Jack Benny, because I can say it in front of this group tonight and to the television audience watching that Unabashedly, I can say that the man is my idol. That's true. When I was in high school, I never missed... <laughs> I never missed now, Jack why Benny. why was that funny? <laughs> when you were in high school, there were no high schools. Maybe <laughs> that's funny. But I used to listen to Jack every single week. And as a matter of fact, after high school, I went into the Navy. And during the three years in the Navy, I became so impressed with Jack that I started to mimic him. I did his gestures. I still have a little bit of my style. I would do his timing. I would do his looks, his inflections. I even started to walk like Jack for a while. Until one night I was picked up by a Marine. <laughs> Who incidentally was one of the nicest dancers I've ever met. <laughs> Jack, I am, I am proud to be the roast master. <laughs> am I going too fast, Milton? Did your pencil break? be the roast master at this uh, Friars Roast for Jack tonight, and we're delighted that the vice president could come here. He does have to go. He has an important meeting in Washington, and we thank you, sir, for being with us this short period, and I know Jack is flattered, and we will continue, and you'll meet our next speaker in just a minute. just returned from running a short errand for Mr. Phil Harris. You know, for 30 years, Phil's mammy has been broiling hammy in Alabama, and we're all pretty sick of it by now. <laughs> so now I present to you a man who, when he says, I'll have one for the road, means the entire federal interstate highway system, <laughs> Mr. Phil Harris. I, uh, I'm delighted, ladies and gentlemen, to be a part of this roast of 
with my dear friend and former employer, Mr. Jack Benny. When I first met Jack, I was a simple country boy from Nashville, Tennessee, unused to the seductions, exotic pleasures, and scintillating sophistication of Hollywood. <laughs> but Jack taught me everything, including how to use big words like them there I just used. <laughs> Jack hired me for his show, and the first time that I went to his house for dinner, I was sitting around waiting for dinner, and Jack says, would you like to have a drink? I said, yes, I'll have a cherry phosphate, please. <laughs> Jack says, no, I mean liquor. Well, I drew back in horror. <laughs> But I didn't want to, you know, appear unsociable, so I said, what kind of liquor do you have in mind? Jack said, how about a martini? So I told him I'd give it a whirl, you know. He said, would you like it with an olive or without? I said, what's the difference? And he said, 10 cents. <laughs> That's the night he got me started. I had one martini with an olive, then another one, and then another one, and finally I told him to leave the olive out. It was taking up too much room. <laughs> but I'll say one thing. Jack's campaign to make me into a Hollywood gentleman was to get me a whole new wardrobe. He said he knew a place where you could walk up one flight and save $10. I got up there, and I was dazzled by the selection of suits, coats, trousers, I've never seen an addict like Jack's. <laughs> so I bought everything in sight, even a secondhand tuxedo. I don't know who wore it last, but I found a lily in the pocket. <laughs> Every time I put it on, my arms kept going like this. <laughs> That's right, folks. Jack Benny made me over, gave me a whole new image. Not just me, he did that with everybody. He magnified everything. Now, you take Don Wilson. When Jack hired him, he was six foot two, weighed 110 pounds. <laughs> Jack kept stuffing him like a goose on day-old bread so he could do fat jokes about him. <laughs> Dennis Day, one of the brilliant intellects of our time. <laughs> Jack made him into a dummy. <laughs> now, we talk about Rochester. You ain't gonna believe this, but when I first met Rochester, he was white. <laughs> Well, be it as it may, and I'm not sure it was, but I know, you know, I now had myself a brand new image, thanks to Jackson. I had curly hair, flashy clothes, a lot of booze, and Jack told me I had to stop living at the YMCA. <laughs> and the Y told me the same thing. <laughs> well, Jack took me by the hand once again. He said that he knew just the apartment for me, and the next day I moved into a place called the Benny Arms. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. High class, it's classy. I mean, the, the most high class place that I've ever been in in my life that was legal. <laughs> Uniform doorman in front, bellhop in the lobby, and an armed guard in the bathroom. That's so nobody could crawl under without paying, you understand? <laughs> Somehow something was still missing from my life, and I don't know what it was, until one day Jack came over and said, Hey, Phil, how would you like to meet some girls? I said, why? <laughs> he said, girls. You see, the thought had never occurred to me. I was so embarrassed that my face got beat red, and it stayed that way ever since. You know? <laughs> but Jack insisted. He said that uh, he'd give me his old dating book that was filled with names of chorus girls that he had known. Of course, it took me a while to round them up because the book just had addresses but no numbers. You see, when Jack was dating, the telephone hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> but I met Follies girls who hadn't committed a folly in 80 years. You know? <laughs> There's no end to the things that Jack Benny taught me. He put the first deck of cards in my hand, took me to my first nightclub, showed me how to shoot craps at Las Vegas, told me how to bet on the horses. That's right, Jackson. You made me what I am today, and I love you for it. But Alice ain't never gonna forgive you. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you, Phil. Here, Ed, put this on your chest. Look natural. Thank you. <laughs> but now I would like to introduce another one of the... You know, I'm so, I'm so busy making notes that I haven't heard a thing. <laughs> I'm so busy stealing them, I haven't made them. That one won't go in the time capsule, Milton. <laughs> Just wanted to get you going. Glad you called on me. I would like to introduce now another that regular... That was Milton Berle that just got up, Ed. <laughs> Careful, the pennies will fall out of his eyes. It's <laughs> supposed to be a roast of Jack, and we're picking on you already. I started to introduce Mr. Guess Dennis reason, Day. I guess the reason for these mics we're supposed to ad lib, aren't we? That's right, George. Okay, I will. <laughs> Eighteen jokes have been done. George says, I will, and Jack falls off the chair. I got to talk to you, George. I don't know why. Dennis is getting older by the minute. But he was a regular on Jack's show for several centuries. Dennis Day is the only man I know who thinks Wayne Newton is a baritone. As a matter of fact, in Ireland, Dennis's voice has often been compared with a nightingale in pursuit of its lover. That's a rough translation, actually, from the Gaelic. What they really said, he sounded like a sparrow in heat. <laughs> Here is the kid himself. Talk, Dennis. <laughs> I'm really happy and thrilled to be here tonight to honor a wonderful man and a steadfast friend. Oh, from love, Dennis. Mr. Jack Benny. You know, I went to work for Mr. Benny when I was just a boy, and through 24 years, our relationship remained exactly the same. I never got a raise. But just knowing Mr. Benny was worth it. He told me that himself. You know, I'll never forget the first day I met him. He invited me to his house, and he asked me if I'd like a drink. And I said, yes, please, I'd like a glass of milk. And he said, homogenized or plain? I said, what's the difference? He said, an olive. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant, but I laughed anyway. <laughs> Mr. Benny, you know, he always took a personal interest in me. For instance, uh, he thought it would help my appearance if I had a new wardrobe. And just by luck, he knew a place where I could get a discount. He even took me there personally. I'd never seen an attic like that before. <laughs> but the clothes were too expensive, so Mr. Benny took me down to the basement where he had another line. <laughs> a little cheaper. I bought everything that was in sight, even a tuxedo. Mr. Benny must have known that I was coming because it was the first tuxedo I ever saw with short pants. <laughs> I don't know who wore it last, but I found a banana in the pocket. <laughs> Turned out it came from the Marquee Chimps. It was a perfect fit. All I had to do was shorten the sleeves. <laughs> Thirteen inches. <laughs> Mr. Benny was always looking out for my welfare like that, though. For example, he didn't like where I was living because he said that it wasn't the right environment. I might go wrong. The people there were a bad influence on me. So I left my mother and father. <laughs> and I moved into my own apartment. It was a place called the Benny Arms. next door to some loud mob drunk. <laughs> I would have moved out, but I was making a fortune in tips, helping old Follies girls up and down the stairs. <laughs> But 
a while, I got to like the place. I even made friends with the guard. And he let me crawl under any time I wanted to. <laughs> but not only did Mr. Benny provide me with my own apartment, but he also thought that a 17-year-old boy should meet some, some girls. So Mr. Benny sold me his old dating book. I had a lot of trouble rounding him up, though, because when Mr. Benny was dating, girls hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> Ooh, You're too can. damn funny to suit me. Well, Mr. Benny, you know, you've taken a lot of ribbing tonight, but I know there's not a person here who doesn't wish you the very best the world has to offer and thanks for all the years of laughter that you've brought everyone. And it goes without saying that those are my sentiments, too. Oh, my mother would have sent her regards, but she doesn't like you. <laughs> Your Johnny. Timing, timing is superb. You have how many children now? Ten. Ten. Well, your timing is either superb or lousy. One is two. Depending on how you look at it, I suppose. That's a fine shame. Yes. What can I say complimentary about our next speaker, Milton Burrow, that hasn't already been said by Milton Burrow? <laughs> Mr. Television. Remember Uncle Milty? I mean, for years, we all went around... Well, for years, we all thought of him as our uncle. Assuming your uncle walks around on the sides of his feet and wears a dress. <laughs> I like to think of Milton as the Myra Breckenridge of comedy. <laughs> and it's always nostalgic when Milton appears on a dais with other comedians. It's kind of like going back and paying a visit to your material. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Milton Burrow. Thank you. Thank you, Merv. It's, uh... How about that introduction you just gave me? Walks on the side. Giants. Beautiful. I needed this. I gave up a funeral to be here. <laughs> did I? <laughs> well, I must tell this... I'm kidding, Eddie. I'm kidding. I, uh... I must tell the truth about you, Johnny. You were hilarious. I'm a big fan of yours. I really am. I'm the one. <laughs> Somebody nudge Phil Harris and tell him where he is, please. <laughs> and he has a great mind, Phil Harris. Give him a glass of wine, and he'll not only tell you the year it was made, but he'll also tell you the name of the broad who jumped on the grapes. <laughs> Laugh it up, Ed, please. Laugh it up. You look beautiful. You look, really, he's got the personality of an empty locker. <laughs> look at Sullivan. He looks like he's being choked to death from the inside. <laughs> Join yourself, George? Have a nice time. Gumming on your cigar? <laughs> I think you just embarrassed me. <laughs> I didn't embarrass you. Too. Dolly Madison embarrassed me. <laughs> she did too. She did too. <laughs> hey, good at living. She did too. Uh, that was her line. <laughs> I know her line. <laughs> oh, by the way, before I go, the, the Jack, if I'm, will you look at me when I speak to you? Uh, sorry to wake you up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm lucky. Go ahead, talk. <laughs> Boy, if I ever switch, you're first. I'll... No, I want to say this. You switched and I wasn't first. <laughs> I'd have said that. Dennis, would you like to leave the room?
This man that we are honoring tonight, this Yasha Heifetz with the hormones removed. <laughs> this man is one of the most exciting men in California. His idea of a thrilling evening is to make obscene phone calls to Hermione Gingold. <laughs> His biggest thrill on Sundays is to wake up his leg. <laughs> our friendship, sincerely, our friendship goes back a very long time. I've known Jack, and this is true, since the early days of Audible. I remember one time in Cleveland, Jack was dating a girl on the bill. She was a contortionist. Jack loved to take her out to dinner every night because of the great trick she used to do. She used to get up on the chair, bend over backwards, and pick up the check with her teeth. <laughs> but he is charitable. He recently contributed $100,000 to the George Jessel Home for Flamenco Dances with Bad Kidneys. <laughs> this man that we are honoring tonight, I have to be truthful, I'm sorry, gives away nothing. <laughs> nothing! I'm getting mad now. Oh, are you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is the only man I know who has a burglar alarm on his garbage can. <laughs> Every night he waits until Mary falls asleep and then turns off her side of the electric blanket. <laughs> when Benny pays, when Benny pays, <laughs> when Benny pays for his own dinner, he thinks he's treating. <laughs> I, I don't want to stay on too long. But uh, <laughs> let me conclude uh, my portion by saying, Jack, uh, honestly, it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Everything I've said about you, Jack, and everything Man. that everyone has said about no is in jest and in fun. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I am doubly thrilled to be standing on this rostrum because I understand President Nixon is watching this show tonight. And not only because of Jack, but he wanted to see what Agnew looked like. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was all the way up my dressing room when I heard the applause. <laughs> wonderful to be appearing on Milton's Telethon. Oh, yeah? I've seen better lines than Buster Crab's face. I got a line here to close the network. I don't know. You almost 20 did. years ago. Give up on the take. And now, Ed, you're coming up next. Oh. <laughs> Want to turn your... <laughs> Alan. Oh, I just want to get a little booze. Huh? All right. <laughs> you're coming up next, Ed. You want to turn on your pacemaker? Use up his one gesture of the I night. Do. I do. I would like to tell you about an experience of appearing on Ed Sullivan's show. When you appear on Ed's television show for the first time, is it a traumatic experience? I was in California in 1954. I had a call from Ed Sullivan. I rushed back. I was excited to be on the show. I brought my little jokes along. And Ed gave me the usual comedy position on the show, being the master showman he is. <coughs> of following Charlton Heston, <laughs> reading uh, excerpts from the Old Testament. <laughs> I, came uh, 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 I came on and died immediately, you know. Ed rushed out and gave me one of those cute little hugs he has where he gets all tangled up with you. <laughs> then he cued me off the wrong side of the stage where I was damn near eaten by a bear. <laughs> Well, and 
he's been preparing for this dinner for weeks, attempting to frame his remark. <laughs> Personally, I like Ed's personality. I find it lighthearted, pixie-like. Ed has the kind of a personality that can immediately trigger an audience to file past him. I saw Ed down in the lobby before the show having a duel of wits with a gum machine. And we're delighted, Ed, that your lovely widow, Sylvia, could be here tonight. <laughs> and all of us I know on the dais here are, are eagerly looking forward to hearing your remarks. But don't forget to lock up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Excitement, Mr. Ed Sullivan. <laughs> Tonight we're playing tribute to one of the... You're rolling, Ed. ...great figures in the industry. <laughs> Jack Benson. And I'm very pleased to be here because Jack and I are very old friends. We first met 40 years ago. At Jack Challenge Eve when he was in his prenatal period. As a matter of fact, Jack's very first radio appearance was on my CBS show back in 1932. I remember distinctly because I noticed that Jack was watching all my moves and studying all my mannerisms. <laughs> it wasn't until years later that I discovered what he had been doing. By carefully observing me, Jack had stolen my entire personality, <laughs> leaving me with practically none. step by step exactly what I mean. For example, I was the very first man in show business ever to fold his arms like this. <laughs> Jack pounced on that and has been using it ever since without so much as a thank you. Another thing Jack noticed was the way I purposely put long pauses between my words. I practiced for years developing that hesitation in my speech knowing that the audience would be kept on the edge of their chair, <laughs> wondering what my next words would be, <laughs> whether there would be any at all. <laughs> and hoping there would not too. <laughs> and when he, too, began pausing between words, I had to go one, one better, and I started pausing between syllables. <laughs> If the truth be known, the only thing that Jack Benny didn't steal from me is his war. He stole that from my wife, Sylvia. <laughs> yes, when Jack Benny first met me, he was nothing but an empty shell. By stealing my personality, he became one of the finest comedians in the country. <laughs> so today, when Jack Benny gets laughs, those are really my laughs. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm stuck with material like Let's hear it for the bouncing Bartok. <laughs> Jack, I really love you, and I want you to know that I really don't mind that you took my diction, my expressions, my mannerisms, but one thing I can never forgive is the fact that you took my smile. In other words, Jack, you are a louse. <laughs> My pleasure now to introduce my friend, Alan King. Yeah. Actually, I should say something nice about Alan. He's been very successful. He's been very generous with his money. His comedy has built many hospitals in Israel, which is only fair because it's made a lot of people sick in this country. <laughs> Would you welcome, please, the Adolf Manju, the crabgrass set, and the Friars historian, Alan King. As a historian of the Friars Club, I, uh, it is usually my function to dig into the past of the guest of honor. 
with Benny, it's not a job for historian, for an archaeologist, maybe. <laughs> Jack Benny's life has been about as exciting as the 4th of July in London. <laughs> Jack was born in Waukegan, Illinois. Not in the hospital, but at home. His mother wanted to go to the hospital, but a voice inside of her kept repeating, it's cheaper here, it's cheaper here. <laughs> Something you may not know, Jack joined the Navy, First World War. He liked the uniform, came without pockets. <laughs> His record shows that he served aboard three ships, the Nina, the Pinter, and the Santa Maria. Decorated for valor, above and beyond the call of duty, I would like to read from the citation. While entertaining aboard a battleship, they came under heavy enemy attack. The vessel was badly hit and in order to lighten the load and remain afloat, volunteers were asked to abandon ship. Jack stepped forward and under these now famous words, I have but one life to give for my country, and threw his piano player overboard. <laughs> that point on, Jack Benny's career skyrocketed. He became a full-fledged movie star. Such notable achievements in Hollywood as the Hollywood Review, To Be or Not To Be, George Washington Slept Here, Buck Benny Rides Again, The Horns Blow at Midnight, which was used as a training film for kamikaze pilots. <laughs> Jack always considered his most artistic achievement the title role in Charlie's Ant, which afforded him the luxury of wearing his own wardrobe. <laughs> But as historian of the Friars, I would be remiss, even during a roast, if I didn't seriously mention the overwhelming accomplishments of Jack Benny, the artist, and the man. 22 years, consecutive radio star. 19 years, television star. Hundreds of nightclubs, theaters, concert engagements all over the world. He's loved, he's revered, respected, uh, I don't know how to compare this man, perhaps St. Joseph, which is a small, dull town in Missouri. <laughs> Jack, always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's all right, Alan. Historians aren't supposed to be funny. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, no dais that purports to represent the friends of Jack Benny and to be a tribute would be complete without the appearance of his best friend, George Burns. George, of course, as you know, Jack, is known for his ability to break you up at any time. Not that it's hard to do. I see you fall down over a speech by Carl Munt. Would you welcome, please, Jack Benny's security blanket, George Burns. Ladies and gentlemen, and um, Jack, you're the guest of honor. If you'd like to laugh now, we'll get it over with. <laughs> and Johnny Carson. <laughs> well, that's pretty funny, the name Johnny Carson. Oh, I thought you were laughing at Johnny. No, no, the name no, Johnny no. Carson, because that's a funny name. <laughs> I don't even kick, you see. I'm no. still laughing at Sullivan. Oh, <laughs> Are you the one? Well, anyway. <laughs> uh, you know, it's strange to see Johnny Carson here tonight, because I usually watch him with my clothes off. <laughs> and somehow he seems funnier with my clothes off. <laughs> Come to think of it, I'm funnier with my clothes off. <laughs> but you know, this, uh, this, uh, this sociable tonight is, 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 is for Jack Benny. He's 75 years old. Amazing, he looks absolutely good. He looks, he looks, he looks absolutely wonderful. He looks as young as Groucho Marx. <laughs> and I've got a reputation for being a comedian's comedian because I can make Jack Benny laugh, and that's not true. 
I don't make him laugh at all. He makes himself laugh. Like I met him at the club, I wasn't doing anything, and he started to laugh. And he knew I wasn't doing anything, but he thought I wasn't doing it on purpose. <laughs> One night, the, uh, the Edward G. Robinsons gave a party, sort of a musicale for Grace Moore. And the, 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 uh, her picture just came out. The, the one night of love, and she was going to get up and sing that song that night. And they lined up two rows of chairs, and Jack sat in front, and I sat in back. And this charming woman got up to sing. And I leaned over to Jack. I said, Jack, if you laugh when she starts to sing, that would be very rude. <laughs> The minute the first note came out, his shoulders shook. They carried him out of the room. So you see, I don't make him laugh. Grace Moore makes him laugh. But let me tell you something. Don't ever, don't ever try to make him laugh. Don't plan to make him laugh because it doesn't work. One night I asked him and Mary to my house for dinner. And he came, he was in a tuxedo, and Mary was in a long dress, and Grace was in a long dress. I was in a tuxedo, and I had a six-piece orchestra, dance floor, and he got there at 8 o'clock, and at 8.30, there was hors d'oeuvres, and the butler came in, he says, dinner is ready at 8.30. And Jack looked at me, he says, where, where, are the, where are the rest of the guests? I said, that's all, just you and Mary and Grace and myself. He says, and you got me in tuxedos, and you and I and Mary in a long dress, and you got the six-piece orchestra and the, and the dance floor. I said, we'll have a ball together. We'll dance after dinner, you can dance with Mary, I'll dance with Gracie, then... You can dance with Gracie, and I'll dance with Mary, and then you can dance with Mary again, I says, and it'll be great because there'll be nobody here to bump into us. <laughs> Cost me $600. <clears throat> I never got a snicker. <laughs> that thing was a disaster. We went into dinner, and the, the top of the salt shaker came loose, and a little salt went into my suit, fell in my suit. Fell down seven times. <laughs> I paid $600, got nothing. He loves salt. <laughs> anyway, Jack, you're 75 and I'm 73. I've known you all my life. And I've known you all my life, Jack, and I've, I can truly say this, I've never met a nicer man. You're a fine man, and I only hope when I get to be your age, I'll look as good as Groucho does, too. <laughs> to hear from the man himself, who is uh, respected, admired, and loved by his fellow professionals, and from everyone who knows him, I guess that would be most of the world, Mr. Jack Benny. In reviewing the evening, I would like to say, first of all, how very flattered I am that the vice president could be here tonight, even for this short time. I'd like to say that even though Mr. Agnew and I have been friends for a long time, he knows that at the last election, I did not vote Republican. Neither did I vote Democratic. <laughs> you see, I happen to be a registered Whig. <laughs> and once I join a party, brother, I stick with it. I'd like to say a few words about our Toastmaster, Johnny Carson. One of his gags was the fact that I have to take a Dramamine <laughs> when I make love. And Johnny, in answer to that, I can only say 
I never take a Dramamine. I take a Dexedrine to keep me awake. <laughs> Then he mentioned the fact, as did some others, about my walk. Now, all the comedians, they claim I walk very effeminately, I walk like a girl. Well, in fact, my very dear friend Phil Harris once said about me when we were together, he was walking behind me. <laughs> He said one of the funniest things I've ever heard. He said, you know what? You could put a dress on Benny and take him anywhere. <laughs> well, maybe I do. I don't think anybody can help the way he walks. Maybe I walk like a girl, but believe me, I am not a feminine. <laughs> Have I bothered any of you fellas? <laughs> We go to Dennis Day, who has always, who has been with me for many, many years. I had him tell him the facts of life and all about the birds and the bees and everything. And now he's married and he has 10 or 11 children. <laughs> Evidently, I made it very interesting. <laughs> of course, it was the great Will Rogers who once said, I never met a man I didn't like. Obviously, he never met Milton Berle. <laughs> anyway, Milton, thanks for being here. Whether your speech was original or not, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> and it was great. Now, I've taken a lot of good ribbing tonight. And I liked it. And I'm sure it was all in good fun, as all of these friars affairs are. I've only got one complaint, which I marked down there, that how could Ed Sullivan accuse me of stealing his personality? <laughs> I know we both work alike, but when I smile, it's not written on a cue card. <laughs> But I really love Ed, and I don't want you to think I'm talking behind his back. If he were here tonight, I'd say the same. <laughs> now I'd like to get to Alan King, that young, very angry man. <laughs> what he's got to be angry about, I don't know, he should be very grateful. In the past, he's attacked the phone company, the airlines, the medical association, all the great American institutions, now tonight, me. <laughs> now, let's see. What else do I want to say here? Well, I can't leave out something. I'd say a few words about my very dear ex-friend, George Burke. <laughs> this man, really and truly, he admitted it tonight, didn't he? says some of the stupidest things. <laughs> and he expects me to laugh. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> but there's a reason for it. You see, after knowing each other for over 50 years, not 40, 50 years, we finally have something in common. We are both senile. <laughs> And now, I would like to thank everyone who made this evening possible. Remember what I said earlier, that I'm, I'm a very lucky man. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. And as I realize tonight, as I stand up here and I look around at this lavish affair, the beautiful women in their gowns, the men in their tuxedos, the big orchestra, when I think of all the preparation that was necessary to make this evening what it is, one thought keeps running me through my mind. Why couldn't they have given me the money? <laughs> Thank you, everybody.